Hey everybody, today I'm going to show you how to install Jellyfin Server and create your own home media system. This will give you access to all of your media on all devices, whether it's through the Jellyfin application or through the web browser. Now there's many ways in which Jellyfin can be installed. We can either install it as a binary, an executable file, like you do for most of your applications on say Windows or Linux, but we can also deploy it in a VM or we could take it a step further and deploy it as a container. I'll show you those first two steps quickly. It's really simple, but the majority of this video is going to focus upon using containers to do this. And also I'll show you how to mount some of your NAS storage into your Jellyfin server container so that you can expand on your storage from a central location. I'm also going to touch on transcoding. I'll explain what that is and talk about some of the requirements that are needed when considering that. So let's get on to the prerequisites. What are you going to need? Well, there's kind of two schools of thought in this. If you're going to be transcoding, i.e. that means making your media compatible across all your devices. For example, you may have some 4K files in HDR and you may only have devices that can play 1080p content in a certain codec and are non-HDR. That means you're going to have to transcode. That means Jellyfin Server will, in real time, change those to a format that your device understands. Now that isn't free, it's resource intensive. So we need to think about that if we're going to want a server that can do transcoding. So back to those two options. The good news is if you've got a dedicated server on consumer gear, you likely have a CPU that has an integrated graphics processing unit, an integrated GPU. Now we can take advantage of that to do the transcoding for us. The beauty is even a real cheap CPU, I'm talking about the ones I've shown in my previous videos, a dual core from a few years ago, that's going to be able to do multiple 4K transcodes in parallel. If you don't have one of those and you're working with say a server CPU, it won't have an integrated GPU. You're either going to need a discrete GPU, i.e. an add-in, a PCI card, just like you would buy for a gaming machine, or you're going to have to have enough cores available so that it can do the transcoding on the CPU. Now, that gives you a slightly better image quality. Whether you can tell or not is a different question, but it is very intensive. You're not going to get the same level of performance, i.e. you won't get as many simultaneous transcodes, and you certainly can't do this on a cheap CPU. So some of the options out of the box, if you don't want transcoding, you'll be happy to know you can use anything really. Even things like a Raspberry Pi are capable of doing a Jellyfin server without the need for any additional hardware. If you're gonna do transcoding, like I've mentioned, any consumer grade Intel or AMD chip, you can take advantage of the integrated GPU. If you're gonna be using server hardware, things like Xeons, etc., or Epic CPUs, Threadrippers, etc., you're gonna need a minimum pass mark now, I'll put something on the screen to show that. But a pass mark is effectively a measure of how performant the CPU is. Now, typically, the figure you want to be looking at is about a 14K, 14,000 pass mark. Below that, you're going to get stuttering, certainly on 4K, HDR, high bitrate streams. So if you're going to be putting this in a virtual machine, for example, you're going to need to make sure that you give it enough cores to equal that 14K pass mark. And if you want to do more than one, you're going to have to double that. So let's go ahead and we'll jump into the installations. So the first installation is using that binary, that executable file, and just going through the wizard. To install on Windows, go to the download section on the Jellyfin website and make sure you click the server tag, not the client. Then click on the Windows tab and just download the Windows installer. Once that's downloaded, you're just going to get the standard Windows installation GUI. You're going to go through those options, hit next, configure those as you like, and you'll be up and running. Okay, so let's move on to virtual machines. Now, if you don't want transcoding, the process is pretty much the same as before, assuming you've got a GUI VM. If you're using the command line interface, there's separate commands for that, and I'll put them on the screen, but they're pretty straightforward. Now, where it gets interesting is if you want to use hardware inside your virtual machine. So let's assume you have Docker running in a VM. 
that you want to enable transcoding on. Now there's a few steps that we need to go through first and I'm going to talk about this in the context of using Proxmox. The first thing you're going to need to do is to check that the IO MMU groups are going to enable this. Now I'll come on to that in a moment but effectively it's the way that all the devices on your machine are carved up into little segments so that you can specify which one you want to use without the host being able to use it. So what this means is Proxmox won't have access to that device. You do that by disabling the drivers, specifically stating that you don't want it to load, and then this enables you to pass it through to a virtual machine. Now, it isn't always guaranteed to work, but usually it's fine. And also, compatibility has become better over the years with more recent hardware. And also, NVIDIA have lifted some of the restrictions on their GPUs. So you used to only be able to do two transcodes. I believe it's now four. And if the config works, then your Docker VM will see that piece of hardware just as it would a normal GPU. And you can assign that to the container. And then the container can take full advantage of that hardware acceleration for transcoding. So let's jump into the configs. The first changes we're going to need to make are on the Proxmox host itself. So what we need to do is check what those IO MMU groups are. So to do that, there's a command that will list all of the PCI devices on your host. Once you have those IDs, you want to block those by specifying them in the mod probe on the host. This is basically telling Proxmox not to use these pieces of hardware. On top of that, we want to disable the drivers as well so that no drivers are loaded for that piece of hardware. For example, it won't load the Intel iGPU, it won't load the Nvidia drivers, etc. Once you've done that, it's pretty straightforward. You simply need to go into your virtual machine and go to the hardware section, click add exactly like we did in the previous video where we added a new hard drive and you simply want to select a PCIe device. Once you've selected that device, you simply need to add it, and it should pick that up when you boot the VM. There are a couple of nuances, things like you may need to specify a ROM. I'm not gonna go into that, but I'll show you the link to the description on the Proxmox website so that you can read up more if you're still having issues. So let's get onto the installation and look at the Docker config file. Now, there are two configs that I'm gonna share with you on my GitHub. One of those is for hardware acceleration and one of those is without hardware acceleration. So you can choose if you're gonna be transcoding or not. Now the Docker config I'm gonna share with you is also routed through our proxy. So that's cool. We get all of the benefits of using CrowdSec to secure it if we're gonna externalize it. It also means that we can run it internally with HTTPS and we can use internal DNS names like jellyfin.yourdomain if we're gonna register that as an internal DNS name on Pi-hole. Awesome. So looking through the config, if you're not gonna be doing transcoding, it's pretty straightforward. It looks just like many of the containers that we've spun up. The difference here is you're probably gonna to want to mount some external storage. Now, how do we do that? Well, if you watch my previous video, where we mounted our NAS, we're pretty much gonna do the same process. I'll put something on screen so you can see the command for mounting a file share on your Linux host. But if you're still not sure, go ahead and check out my TrueNAS video and it will show you how to install TrueNAS and configure a share across your network. To map the folder to a NAS, it's exactly the same as any other folder. We simply share where we've mounted our NAS drive into the container. So you might have slash media slash films, you would just put that in the slash films directory on your Jellyfin host and you can select that then as a folder when you go through the wizard which we'll get onto shortly. And that's pretty much it. That's all you're going to need to spin this up without transcoding. Now if you want to get onto transcoding you'll see a few options that are commented. This is where it gets interesting. So the most important part really is the group add section. Now you need to find the ID of the user that controls your GPU. So what do we mean? On Proxmox, we've disabled it using the GPU. Within the VM template, we've selected the GPU we want to pass through. Now on your Docker VM, you need to run the following command to show what the ID of your GPU is. And then you simply need to specify that number in this config. 
Once you've done that, you'll notice that there's a new section that we haven't covered before, devices. And it's pretty straightforward, right? You specify the device on your virtual machine that you want Jellyfin to have access to. So Linux has all of those available in the slash dev slash DRI folder. And so we just want to select the ones that we're using. This will differ depending on whether you're using Intel, AMD, Nvidia, etc. But you simply need to choose the folder structure that matches the hardware you're using. And that's it. Those are the only differences really between the two configuration setups. So let's go ahead and run that and see what happens. One thing to remember, if you're getting errors when you spin up this container, it might be complaining about the logs folder. Now, that typically means that you didn't create the folders that you're using for the mount before you spun up the container. Because the container is running as a root, it's going to create folders that it then cannot write into. So go ahead with whatever your default user is, create those folders and then spin up the container. So the installation process through the web GUI is really simple. You just need to navigate to the domain that you specified in your traffic label, or if you're not gonna do that route, just specify the IP of your Docker VM and the port that you mapped it to. The default is 8096. Remember that it's HTTP, not HTTPS, otherwise it's gonna complain about a protocol error. So go ahead and specify your language, Create a username and password. And this is where you need to specify your first media library. So click add a library, tell it the type of library that you want to add. And then you're gonna to want to specify the folder you want to use. There's also some interesting things in there that you might want to configure, such as who you want the media crawler to be, i.e. which service do you want to go to to get all of the statistics for your media. Things like the name, the title, the date, etc. So you notice on the example here, I've got folders that I specified that are mapped to my NAS. So those have all of my media inside. Repeat that process till you've added all of your media. Select the metadata language you want to use for your media. Then specify whether you want to use this as remotely accessible. In this case, we are doing. And that's it. You then go and log in for the first time and you'll be presented with the default dashboard and in the background, it should already be going ahead, scanning all of those folders and populating the metadata. So you should see the dashboard updating with the tiles for each of your media items. And when that's completed, you're pretty much good to go. You can go in and specify additional configuration steps. Um, there's a whole host of customizability. You can add users. You can only allow them to watch certain films, etc. I'm not going to go into too much detail on that, but hey, you now have a working Jellyfin server that's protected by CrowdSec, is routed through your pie hole with an internal DNS name, and is secured by HTTPS through the proxy. Awesome. If you want to validate that your transcoding is working, you simply need to play the content from your Jellyfin server in a format or resolution that's different to the native media. So if you've got a 4K file, why don't you play that through your web browser? You'll see that transcoding is then taking place if you click on the dashboard on the left hand menu and press the I button on the media itself. It should say hardware transcoding. And if that's all good, excellent. You've got yourself a perfectly working Jellyfin server. It's awesome, it's lightweight, it's open source. What's not to love? Anyway, that's a wrap for this video. On the next video, I'm gonna be showing you how to do backups for your home lab.